Spreet this evening. Tyler Cunningham is going to come up and sing a song for us, and I'll let him introduce his song and let him use this mic if he wants, and I'm going to go to the piano. Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs> we'll be singing the wonder of it all. There's a wonder of sunset at evening. The wonder as sunrise I see. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is a wonder that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. There's the wonder of springtime and harvest. The sky, the stars, the sun. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that's only begun. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Amen. Thank you. No, I do not. I got one of these. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to what is next, the Bible Prophecy Seminar. That was beautiful, amen? Okay, we have some exciting things happening tomorrow at 6 p.m. We're going to tell you about the cure to low self-esteem, so if you have some self-image issues, that will be over tomorrow night around 6.45, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we will have the second presentation um, called History's Greatest Hoax at 7 p.m., and then we will have a presentation on Sunday called The Imposter, which is the Antichrist, part one, and then if you come Monday night, you're the preacher because we don't have any meetings on Monday night. And then on Tuesday at 7 p.m., we're going to ask the question, who is the imposter? Who is the Antichrist? And you are going to tell me who the Antichrist is. I will not tell you. You will tell me. How does that sound? All right. That sounds great, according to two people. All right. <laughs> Let's pray as we begin tonight's message the land of the lawless. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have to open your word. And now as we um, are getting ready to dive into the pages of scripture, we ask that you would bless as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. There was a, a man who was going to have a uh, business trip and he couldn't find anybody to watch his dog. And so he was trying to find a hotel, many hotels today. You can take your pets with you. But back then, this wasn't so common. He decided that he was going to write a letter to the hotel owner. And he said, Dear hotel owner, I have a very well-mannered dog. My dog is well-groomed and very obedient. And I would like to bring my dog to your hotel and have my dog sleep overnight there in my room. May I do it? 
Well, promptly a reply came back from the owner of the hotel, and he said, <clears throat> Dear sir, I have never had a dog in this hotel that has stolen towels. I have never had a dog in this hotel that has taken pictures off the wall. I have never had a dog in this hotel that I have had to throw out in the middle of the night because it was drunk. I have never had a dog in this hotel that I had to evict because it was fighting with somebody else in its room. And I have never had a dog that has run off without paying its bill. Yes, sir, bring your dog, and if the dog vouches for you, you can come to <laughs> management. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a society that has lost its moral compass, hasn't it? Stealing towels and sneaking off without paying bills, I wish that was the only thing that we had to discuss this evening. I mean, the problem in our society today is that many individuals say that there is no right and wrong, that what is true for you is tr not true for me. There is two truths, and you could just be your own God, okay? This, there's something called postmodernism. Has anybody ever here heard of this concept of postmodernism? That, that there is no absolutes. And don't let anybody get away with saying something I would say dumb like that. And the reason why is because when you say there is no absolute, you have just made an absolute. So you have contradicted your own statement and you have broken the philosophical law of non-contradiction, which is the foundation of all reason and logic. So in saying that there is no moral absolutes, you have just made an absolute and destroyed everything that you're trying to do. Does that make sense? So don't let anybody get away with some, saying something like that because they have just ripped the foundation out from underneath themselves. So postmodernism says that, that there, there are, no, are no moral absolutes and uh, you can have your truth and I can have my truth. And friends, listen, when you're talking about you like Ford, you like Chevy, you like Toyota, you like Honda, yeah, that can be true for you. But, friends, it is a grammatically incorrect statement to say that there are two truths, right? It is, it, is not, it is not grammatically correct. And so with that in mind, we go to question number one. You guys have your hand out? All right, question number one. What is the natural condition of the human heart? Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Okay, and that is why we go up to Proverbs twenty-eight, twenty-six. He who trusts his own heart is a what? And Mr. T was popular in the eighties for saying what? I pity the fool, right? So he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, and I pity the fool that trusts his own heart. So the condition of the human heart is wicked. The Bible also uses the heart to represent the feet, the seat of the thoughts and the emotions combined, which is your moral character. It represents the true character of man. So what is the natural condition of the heart? What, what would you write on your line? Deceitful and desperately wicked. And we talked last night about trying to be good, right? If the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, then there is no such thing as good unless you are talking about God because Jesus said there was no one good but God question number two what can God do for the human heart okay Romans 1 16 says um, oh you got to go to your Bible for this Romans 1 16 Romans we're going to be in the book of Romans quite a bit tonight Romans 1 and verse 16 anybody here like to shoot off fireworks I mean, the real ones, not like bang snaps. I mean, half stick of dynamite, like those types of things. I remember one year we had we had this half stick of dynamite and I had it in my arm like this and I had I, ha I was holding it and I held it so that as soon as I heard that lick, that wick light, I would throw it. And so I, I got myself in the position, not down here, but here. So as soon as I heard that light, I was throwing it. And it lit, and I threw it, and I'm telling you, boom! I mean, it was so loud. 
My next door neighbor came out and yelled at us. You guys are going to hurt yourself. You know, there's a lot of power and dynamite, isn't there? I mean, that's how Mount Rushmore, how how Mount Rushmore was was made by dynamite. Okay, some chiseling, but a lot of dynamite, too. There's a lot of power in dynamite. And when you see in Romans 1 16, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. It is the what? It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew also and for the Greek. That word for power is dunamis, which is where we get our English word dynamite. And so the gospel is God's dynamite power to change the heart, which is evil and desperately wicked into a heart that wants to obey God. It's called the miracle of conversion, and it can happen for you tonight. Now, I went to the mall and I asked people, what do you think sin is? And uh, I, I, I walked right up to people and I said, I'm doing a one question survey and I'm asking the question, what is sin? What kind of what kind of responses do you think I got? I walked up to anybody in a mall and I just said, I'm doing a one sur- one question survey. What, what do you think? I got it's what your neighbor does. Right. They said something really bad. Right. And it was all these nebulous answers that were very vague and the bible says just like noah webster writes the the dictionary definition himself whosoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness okay so now then you need to ask a follow-up question so sin is the transgression of, of the law now the fun thing about this is there's more than one law in the bible there's the, the civil law, there's the law of nature, such as gravity, and the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And there's the ceremonial law, and then there's the Ten Commandments law. Which law is sin the transgression of? Let's go to Romans 7 and verse 7. Romans 7 and verse 7. We do not have to guess because this is a very easy answer. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. Are you there? What shall we say then is the law sin? Certainly not. And that phrase certainly not in the Greek is Paul's fun word mega enoito. It's his way of saying, are you nuts? Mega enoito. Is the law sin? No, it's how we define sin. That's basically what he's getting ready to say. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law for I would not have known covetousness which which law says you shall not covet that's the 10th commandment in the 10th commandment I would have not known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet and then let's look at James chapter 2 and verse 10 he uh, he helps us uh, answer this question For whosoever shall keep the whole law and stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Now watch this. For he who said, do not commit adultery. Now which law says, you shall not commit adultery? That's the seventh commandment, right? You shall not commit adultery and also do not murder. Oh, which one is that? Number six, don't get your kicks from killing one another. I have this Ten Commandments song in my head, and that's how I remember what, what... which one it is, right? So that's number six. Um, do, do not murder. Maybe we'll teach you that song some night out, out here. Now, if you do commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a what? A transgressor of the? So which law is sin the transgression of? It's the Ten Commandment law of God that God gave to Moses and he put it inside the ark. Okay, so the note for four says in the Old Testament, there is the ceremonial and Ten Commandment laws. The ceremonial law was done away with at the cross. So sin is not the transgression of that law. That only leaves one law, the Ten Commandment moral law. Sin is the transgression of that law. Can I have a a bottle of water? She just got up and walked away. All right. So is that clear? 
Question number five. Who wrote the ceremonial law? Who wrote? There is a difference between who wrote the ceremonial law and there is a difference between who wrote the Ten Commandment moral law. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 24 and 26. So it was when Moses, who? Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book when they were finished. Then he said, take God said, take this book of the law and put it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Thank you, sir. And so who wrote the ceremonial law, friends? Moses. And then where was the ceremonial law placed? Outside the ark on a pocket on the outside. So what we're going to do is we're going to notice the difference between the ceremonial law and the uh, Ten Commandment law. Now, who wrote the Ten Commandments? This is question number six. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the what? Finger of God, right? And so who wrote the ceremonial law? Who wrote the Ten Commandment law? God did. So Moses wrote the ceremonial law when God told him what to write, and it was placed on the outside of the ark on a pocket written in a book. And then the Ten Commandment law was written by the finger of God placed inside the ark of the covenant. Question number seven. What is the difference between God's law and his ceremonial law? Well, there's a nice little chart there for you right in your handout. Right. So the Ten Commandment is called the royal law. The ceremonial law is called the law contained in ordinances. The Ten Commandments are spoken by God. And then the ceremonial law was written by Moses. The Ten, the ten Commandment was written by God on stone. The ceremonial law was written by Moses in a book. And then the Ten Commandment was placed in the ark. The ceremonial law was placed beside the ark. The Ten Commandments is perfect according to Psalms 19 verse 7. Then ceremonial law made nothing perfect, according to Hebrews 7 and verse 19. The Ten Commandments removed, uh, not removed, not removed by Christ. Ceremonial law abolished by Christ. Ephesians 2.15 tells you that. And then the Ten Commandments are magnified by the Messiah, which is Jesus. Isaiah 42.21 says that. And then the ceremonial law is abolished by Christ. Colossians 2.14 the Ten Commandments gives you the knowledge of sin, according to Romans 3, verse 20. And then the ceremonial law was instituted because of sin, according to Leviticus 3 and verse 7. The Ten Commandments last forever, and the ceremonial law has a termination point when Jesus fulfilled them on the cross. If that makes sense, let the church say amen. And that's why it's all there right for you with all the Bible texts and the goods right there in your handout that you can have forever. Question number eight. What are two? What are the two great principles found in the Ten Commandments? What are the two great principles? Yep. Let's go to uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 20 and let's read the entire Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 and verse one. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. Exodus 20 verse 1, Exodus 20 verse 1. Are you there? And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Friends, nobody can compete with God. There's lots of other would-be gods in this world, but they can't compete with God because they can't help you to take your next breath. They can't do what God can do, and that's why we should have no other gods before him. And then number two, you should not make for yourself a carved image of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. God is too big to be represented as an image. And it is offensive to him when we try to make images and, and worship and bow down and try to serve them as if they were Baal or Moloch or Chemosh or that one owl that's mentioned in Scripture. And then 
When you go to verse 7, that's the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Um, I, I hope that I'm not the first to tell you that God's last name is not damn it. Amen? And usually that is only said in extreme circumstances of anger, right? And so, I mean, some people, I, I, won't, even, I won't even say that, but you know what? How are other ways that we can take God's name in vain? We say that we're a Christian, and we act like the meanest, terrible person that you can be. When we say that we love Jesus, but we're rude and critical and judgmental, and we gossip, and we make life hard for people who are trying to live for the Lord and trying to work for the Lord, right? Some people say, I've been in the whale, you know, for 14 years, and more, more than that, and someone else said, yep, they've really been in the way for 14 years. We try to work in spite of them, right? All right, so if you're going to say you're a Christian, maybe your face should know it, and maybe even your wife or your dog should know it. If you come home and your dog runs away with his tail between his legs, that dog knows something, right? So if you're a Christian, your dog should know, and even your wife and children should know. Because if you are one way in church, you know, your wife knows whether you're a Christian or not. She knows. And your husband knows if you're a Christian, dear sister. And it's just not, it just doesn't make sense to live one way in the church and be another person somewhere else. And so God's counsel is to be who you are everywhere you are. And hopefully that is a true Christian. Amen. Then remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God wants to spend one whole day with you. And he even made it a commandment. And so this is a commandment. That is all about a relationship. So there's your first four commandments. The first four talk about your duty to God on the vertical aspect. And then when you get your relationship with God right and you understand where you came from and how you relate to God, then you're ready to go on the horizontal level with mankind and learn how to relate to others. Let's talk about that. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother. You should respect them, you should listen to them, and when they get older, you should take care of them. Amen? So then the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, and that means to take somebody's life. And another way to murder is to lessen the degree of their life by making fun of them and calling them stupid. And basically, there's this new term called cancel culture. You ever heard of that? Where what, whatever, whenever somebody like Will Smith, he smacked Chris Rock, he has been canceled in the Hollywood scene. He has not been offered another movie position ever since the slap. That is cancel culture, and that is a form of murder. So when we make fun of somebody and we try to build, to tear them down and build ourselves up, in a sense, you have killed them. All right? So you want to be careful about that. And then number seven. You shall not commit adultery. I won't want my wife to cheat on me, and so therefore, I'm not going to cheat on her, right? And if I see that a girl is attracted to me and she comes on to me, I talk about how pretty my wife is and how beautiful her red hair and her blue eyes are, and if she still comes on to me, I will be rude and halfway enjoy it. <laughs> Amen? Because I have a family to protect and also a job to keep. And the Michigan Conference does not play. If you have an adulterous affair, you're gone. And that's, and that's just the facts. All right. And so don't play around the tree of knowledge when it comes to flirting with other women. Don't. All right. Then you shall not steal. I don't want anybody to steal from me, so I'm not going to steal for, from you. Your money is as safe with me as it is in your own pocket. And so that's how it should be. We should not have to lock everything, but in this world, you better. Okay? And then the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And sometimes you can lie with the wink of an eye, with an expression of a face, and sometimes you can tell a half-truth. Right? There's lots of different ways to lie, even with body language. And then... Number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or their, or their, you should just not covet. 
And so then he, Moses gives a couple things that you could covet. And what's the principle there? Be happy with what you have because you have Jesus. Amen? And so when you get the first four, which is your duty to man, to God, and then the last six are your duty to man, then you are able to live a happy, happy life. And see, a lot of people think that the Ten Commandments are very restrictive, and they are very, very, um, very narrow and very straight. Now, have you ever driven on a highway on the side of a cliff? Anybody ever went on the West Coast and there's a 60, 50, you know, 100 foot drop and then there's a guardrail between you and death? Have you ever thought to yourself, wow, that guardrail is just so restrictive. I just wish somebody could take it away so that I could have more liberty and freedom. Right? If you have a sheepfold and you have fences and there's wolves outside at nighttime that come around and look for food. And the sheep just think, wow, I wish these fences would just go away because I just want to go over and sniff those roses over there. Right. That's not that's not what the sheep are thinking. I don't know what sheep think. I don't talk to sheep very well, very, very much. But I would think that they would appreciate what the fence does which is protect them. And friends, that's exactly what the Ten Commandments are. It is protection. Just like all Adam and Eve had to do was not eat from the tree of knowledge, and it was their protection. And when they ate from that fruit, they made your funeral possible. Okay? And so we're in a world where things happen which should not have been able to happen, and all it was was Eve and Adam ate a piece of fruit. They did not rob a bank. They did not cut somebody's throat. They bit fruit. And people ask, does God mean what he says? Yeah, I think he does. I think, I think, I think he does. All right, we're ready to move on to question number nine. Question number nine. And you have that really good chart which explains, and still in question number eight, how God's law is a written transcript of his character. And you just go all the way down that law. God is holy, just, perfect, love, righteous, truth, pure, spiritual, unchangeable, and eternal. You'll have a statement where it says God is all of that. And then you have other statements in the scriptures that says that the law is all of that. So God, how long has God had a law? Well, if the Ten Commandments are a written transcript of his character, then the Ten Commandments have existed as long as God has existed. God has always had a character, so therefore God has always had a law. That's very simple reasoning. Okay, question number nine. Why does Satan hate God's law so much? Now we're going back to Tuesday night, okay? No, uh, Wednesday night. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? Satan understands this principle that law establishes authority and who you obey is your master. And when you are putting yourself in God's kingdom, you are submitting to God's law. You live in America, you submit yourself to the laws of the state, whether or not you like the governor or whether or not you like the state. And so Romans 13 will tell you that God has put the leaders who are there in place for the most part. Not every single one God has put because there's a text in Second uh, Kings it's, or Chronicles that says they have set up kings but not by me. But according to Romans 13, for the most part, the laws of the land and the, and the rulers of the land are ordained by God. And if you go against them, you're going against God. So you want to be careful about how you relate to our current president, because if you disrespect him, you are disrespecting God. OK, so one of the key marks of a Christian is how you relate to authority. Now, when I was young, I had a hard problem with authority. Because my dad did not show, did not uh, demonstrate authority in a very positive manner, okay? And um, it took me a while to learn how to relate to things like cops, right? For me, cops were the enemy. Well, because the thing was, we just had this conversation with my son. There was a, there was a, a, the sheriff of, 
of uh, Beaverton was following behind me. And uh, Carla's like, are you going the speed limit? I said, yeah, I'm going 55 miles an hour. And uh, she said, well, then you have nothing to worry about. And see, the cool thing about that is when you're doing the right thing, you don't have to be afraid of the authorities, do you? Amen? And when you are, 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 are disobeying willfully, you are afraid of the authorities. Remember what happened when God came in the Garden of Eden and he said, Adam, where are you? What happened? They ran because they were naked and they thought that God was there to carry sentence out. On the day you eat thereof, you will surely what? And they got out of there because they thought that God was coming to carry out sentence. But what was the first thing that God asked them? Adam, where are you? Now, what does that, what is that? It's almost like God saying, hi, honey, I'm home. Right? Adam, where are you? In other words, yesterday you came up and you came up to me and you told me about your whole day. Now you're running away from me. What does that infer about the relationship that God still expected to have with Adam and Eve even after they sinned? It's that he wanted it and that he wasn't angry. And many people have this idea that God is angry when we sin and we're just trying to appease an angry God through Jesus. And that is just not the picture of a God that we serve in the scriptures. You know what the clearest story in the whole Bible is about how we should understand who God the father is? The, the prodigal son. When the prodigal son basically told his dad, I want you to die, so give me your money. You only got money when the father died. He says, Dad, I wish you were dead. I want your money, but I don't want you. And that's what a lot of people are like, and they say it with their lives, not with their mouth towards the Lord. And so we want heaven. We just don't want God. We want to be safe, but we don't want to be in a saving relationship with the son. Okay? And so they... they, uh, The the story goes that he wasted all of his money, his father's hard-earned money, on prostitutes and parties and all of this, and he had himself a nice little time. But where was the father this whole time? He was sitting on the porch, on the rocking chair, twiddling, you know, whittling his little stick or doing whatever, looking down that long, dusty road until one day he saw that familiar gait of his son walking up, and what did he do? Did he call the police? He ran to him and put his his ring on his finger, which is a sign of ownership in scriptures. The slaves got a uh, a, a ring of ownership on them from their master, according to um, the culture there. And he put his own new garment on him, which is a symbol of the righteousness of Christ. And he said, my son has come home. And they had a big feast. Friends, when you... When you break off your sins by doing righteousness like King Nebuchadnezzar did in Daniel 4, there's a party in heaven. And God is not ready to put you on probation when you come back just to see what kind of person you're going to be. He has a celebration and he's looking for us to repent and turn around and come back to him. Now, if that isn't a God of love and if that is a God you can't serve, then I don't know what you need to hear. All right. So... Now we go on to question number 10. Can God ever change? Well, there's a whole bunch of statements in the Bible that says no. Malachi 3, verse 6, I am the Lord I God, I do not change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and, for, and forever. Um, this, should be, this should be Psalms 89, verse 34. Sorry for the typo. Does it stay that in your handout? Yep. Psalms 89, verse 34. Life's not good without a good typo every once in a while on the screen. My covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. So does God change? Does his character change? Yeah? It it, it doesn't. But see, here's the thing. I know someone who, uh, who was getting ready to commit suicide. They went up on the roof of the University of Pittsburgh and they felt so bad about their life, and he was going to jump off the, the, the roof of the University of Pittsburgh, and he turned on the radio, and he was looking for one little glimmer of hope. And some radio preacher, it's funny how these stories happen. This is a true story. Uh, I can't say who the person is because some of you might know him. 
Um, don't worry, it's not your pastor. So, <laughs> so, so what the preacher said was, do not base how you feel about yourself based on your circumstances. Base how you feel about yourself, about God, and how he feels about you and his unchanging circumstances. I am the Lord, thy God, I do not change. So therefore, when God says, I love you, it doesn't matter if you get a job or you get fired. Whether you get married or she runs out, God still loves you. Can you say amen to that? Whether you sin or whether you obey, God is the same. And I'm glad that I can serve a God that is consistent because of I, my emotions go up and down. Sometimes I run hot, sometimes I run cold. But I'm glad that I can always lean on a God who does not change. Can you say amen to that? Now, what did Jesus have to say about the law? Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And so even still, these words are very clear. God, Jesus said that I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And many people think that the word fulfill means destroy or do away with. Now, let's let's have an exercise here and let's install where it says fulfill with with uh, with destroy. Okay, watch this. I did not come to destroy the law, but to destroy the law. Does, does, does fulfill mean do away with? Let's put in do away with. I did not come to destroy, but to do away with. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. You see what I'm saying? And so here he says, I am not coming to destroy. And the reason why in the context the Pharisees and the people who were listening to him were trying to, were, were getting ready to say, he could read their thoughts and their body language, this guy's coming to do away with the law. And at that point he says, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. There's over 300 verses and uh, 300 prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament, and that is what he was getting ready to say. Now furthermore, this phrase, the law and the prophets, is not talking about the Ten Commandments. How do I know that? Okay, there is a, a Hebrew literary term called mirism. What is it? Mirism. A mirism is the first and the last, okay? There, the mark of the beast is a mirism. He causes all, both small and Great, rich, poor, free, slave. There's three mirrorisms right in a row in the Mark of the Beast in Revelation uh, 13, 9 through 12. So a mirrorism is a summary of everything by starting with the first and the last. It's kind of like you like scientific notation where you're trying to write a big number by using by using a couple little letters or numbers. OK, so Hebrew mirrorism is trying to summarize a lot of things by comparing the, the beginning with the end. And so the law is another another word for the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That is what is called the Torah. And Torah simply means. Law. That's it. And then the rest of the Old Testament is the writings of the prophets. And so in context, what he, what he was saying was, I'm not coming to destroy the Old Testament. I'm coming to what? But some people who don't understand the concept of what Jewish mirrorism is, they mean that he did not come to destroy the Ten Commandments. And that is an oversim- I say undersimplification of what that means. If that makes sense, let, let the church say amen. Mirrorisms are used all over, all over the scriptures, all over the scriptures. All right, so we're learning here. This is good. All right, uh, question number 12. What did Jesus come to do in regard to the law? Okay, 
Isaiah 42 and verse 21. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it what? Honorable. Okay. I need glasses. And uh, if I don't have glasses, uh, you all become blurry. Right. Anybody else in that same boat? So I'm going to magnify this piece of paper. Watch it go up in smoke. Okay. It's going to just burn up. Oh, I can actually read it. So when I magnify something, it means to fill full or to make clear. Why would God do away with something that Jesus spent three and a half years making clear? Amen? Just think these things through. All right. Next, next question. Okay, well, I'm going to read the note before we go to the next question. In Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount in which he explained that, that keeping God's law extends to our thoughts. The Jews only thought that it was actions. No, it is thoughts. Matthew 5, 21 through 28 tells us that keeping the letter of the law is not all God requires. I mean, you can literally keep the letter of, in your law just by staying in your room all day. The life of Jesus gives us a perfect example And friends, there is nobody more social than Jesus. Perfect people skills, that man. Okay? So the law of God is not only what we do, it's also what we think. And it's not so much that I'm afraid of what I do, because after conversion, I kind of know what I'm going to do. It's what I think that scares me. It's what I think. (laughs) When someone says something to me and you're smiling and you're thinking one thing, but you actually say something, that is what God needs to clean up, is the thoughts. So that the thoughts and the emotions, that's what makes up the moral character. Okay, So the thoughts and then the actions need to become more in alignment by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Okay, now what is the purpose of, of the law? What is the purpose of the law? Let's go to Romans 3 and verse 20. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're fine. Romans 3 and verse 20. Romans 3, 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in, in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of what? Sin. So the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to point out what? Sin. Now, if you have a smudge on your face, you know, the scriptures say that the Ten Commandments are like a mirror. Can the mirror clean the smudge on your face? All you do is make the mirror dirtier, right? That's, and then you have to clean the mirror. Then your face is dirty and the mirror. Then you've got to clean two things. But the purpose of the law is to tell you that you are going to hell unless you repent and then you go to Jesus and you repent and confess your sins and then he takes them away from you, right? And so the purpose of the law is to simply point out sin. It was never, ever, ever meant to congratulate man or to save man. Question number 14. What what does John, the revelator, I'll take that as a digital amen. All right. Revelation 12, 17, what does John say about the law? And the dragon, who's the dragon, everybody? Satan was enraged with the woman. Now, in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, Jeremiah. No, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Jeremiah 6, verse 2. The whole book of Hosea all uh, teach that a woman represents a church in Bible prophecy. The dragon was enraged with the church, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God. So Satan is enraged with the church that keeps God's commandments. Do you want Satan to be happy with you? By default, if Satan is happy with you, then God can't be happy with you, right? And so Satan is enraged with this woman who places themselves under God's authority Because if you're placing yourselves under God's authority, you're thereby saying, I don't want to be under Satan's authority. And so God is is trying to do something in us where he's trying to save us without saving sin because he cannot take sin to heaven. And so he's trying to separate sin from man. Okay, what else does John say? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those 
who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in contrast to those who follow the beast and receive his mark, there are some who will not that are going to keep God's commandments under the most extreme peer pressure when this thing goes down, called the mark of the beast. And then it says in 22.14 of Revelation, Blessed are those who do his what? Commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. Now notice the, notice this. If you keep his commandments, you have right to the what? And then you get to? If an angel was put out breaking God's commandments, you're not getting in doing the same thing. I mean, literally, somebody could have said amen to that. All right, thank you. Let me know you're awake. Okay, now let's deal with some interesting, difficult texts that some people have about the law. Isn't Christ the end of the law? Inevitably, we talk about this subject. They always go to Romans 10, verse 4. And let's go in our Bibles and turn to Romans 10 and verse 4. Another digital amen. Amen, brother. All right, Romans 10 and verse 4. Are you there? For Christ is the what? End of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. Now, maybe we should look at another place how Paul uses the same word, end. Okay? So that word end is telos. It means means properly the point aimed at. And we'll talk about that in a second. Go to 621 of Romans. Go to Romans 6 and verse 21. Romans 6 and verse 21. Now watch how Paul uses this word end. For when you were slaves of sin, you were... That's 20. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the... End of those things is, in other words, if you continue living how you used to live in sin, the end or the logical progression where that takes you is what? Because the wages of sin is death. He's not speaking out of both sides of his mouth. But now look at verse 22. You can see how he uses the word end and it can't mean do away with. But having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, which is everlasting life. So if you're living by the fruits of the Spirit, the end of that or the logical progression of that is everlasting life. There you have it. So let's look at a couple other places in the Bible where this word end, the same Greek word is used. If you make this word end to mean do away with, we cause some problems. Look at 1 Peter 1, 9. Receiving the end of your... So if end means do away with, what have we done away with? Faith. That's not what it means. And so you have to look at how the prophets used words then and what they meant then, not what words that we use today mean then. You have to let the prophet tell you what he means by what he says back then. And so receiving the end of your faith means salvation. If you have faith in Jesus, the just shall live by what? And then that means you will receive salvation. Okay, another one. James 5, verse 11. Look what happens if we mean end to do away with. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard the perseverance of Job and see the end intended by the... Lord, so what, who do we do away with if end means do away with? You do away with the Lord. I, we're just being, being reasonable here. And so now I want to do an, uh, an exercise with you that is quite fun. Okay, so when I say you, you are the people. Who are you? And then when I do this, you say, and then this. Oh, come on. This is being recorded on Facebook. Let's do a little better than that. Now the people. Now the go to to hear the 
preach the of and his because of which is a transgression of the okay very good let's do it one more time now the peep the go to to hear the preach the of and his because of which is transgression of the okay they say the law is done away with so let's make the law go away watch what happens now the go to to hear the preach the of and his because of if there's no law what's the purpose of a law it points out sin romans 3 verse 20 so if there is no law then there is no sin now the go to to hear the preach the of and his if there's no law there's no sin and if there's no sin then there's no need of grace so grace go away now the go to to hear the preach the of and if there's no law there's no sin and if there's no sin there's no need of grace and if there's no grace then there's no need of Jesus now the go to to hear the preach the friends if there's no law there's no sin if there's no sin there's no need of grace and if there's no need of grace there's no need of Jesus and if there's no Jesus then there is no gospel now the go to to hear the preach about nothing you see what happens when you take away the law of God it just destroys everything it literally just destroys everything now the people go to church for literally to show off their hats or their cars or whatever okay so now what about being under the law what about being what does Paul mean when he says let's be you, under the law go to Romans 6 and verse 14 okay Romans 6 and verse 14 for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace and people take this text and they make it say that if you're keeping God's commandments you're under the law okay how many here have been pulled over by a police officer and when you get pulled over, you just speed right off, don't you? You don't, because you're under, the, you're under the law. You're under the authority of the police at that, at that point, right? If you're under the law, Paul uses the phrase under the law in two senses in his writings. You're breaking the commandments of God, so you're under its penalty. But then the burden of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians is to demonstrate that law and circumcision and keeping ceremonialism does not save you. Faith does. That's the purpose of all of those prison letters. Okay, you know he wrote those letters when he was in prison. Well, except Galatians, that wasn't one of them. But the other prison letters, he, that's the purpose of those letters to show that ceremonial law never ever saved you. And so there was a point in Paul's life where he believed that ceremonialism did save you, and for then he was under the law as a means of righteousness. And he rejects that in his prison letters, and now his ministry in those letters is to show that you cannot be saved by law because the purpose of law is not to save but to condemn and then point you to Jesus for salvation. Now, I want to share with you something that is just very, just very obvious. When you, when you, the, I had a conversation with a Baptist pastor once, and he told me that I was telling people to keep the commandments, and he was telling me that I was bringing them under the law. I, I said, now, now let's think this through. The Greek word for sin is harmatia. What is it? Harmatia. It literally means to miss the mark, right? Harmatia means what? To miss the mark. Now think this through. In the archery, in the Olympics, in Paul's day, when these things were written, 
They had three shots. And if you aimed at the bullseye and you missed, it was sin one. Sin is an archery term. It's a sports term. And then if you missed the bullseye again, it was sin two. And then if you missed the bullseye the third time, it was sin three. Now think this through. Sin is missing the what? If there is a mark to miss, doesn't it follow that there must be a mark to hit? He took it from the sports world, but how did Paul mean? Sin is the missing of God's Ten Commandment law. And the same pastor who will tell you that the law is done away with will tell you to confess your sins. Are you picking up when I'm laying down? There is no way to confess your sin if the law is done away with because there's no way to say what sin is if there is no law. Romans 4.15 says, where there is no law, there is no sin. Does that make sense? You see how logical the scriptures are? See, here's, here's the thing. Question 17, we're almost done. What is the only motivation to keep God's law? And this is what Satan doesn't want you to know. If you love me, keep my commandments. He's quoting Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. This is man's duty. Love God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. He's, re- he's repeating Psalm, Solomon's uh, text when he said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Then in Romans 13, verse 10, it says, Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the what? Fulfilling of the law. The Ten Commandments, friends, is a law of love. It's where I focus on God, and when I get that right, I focus on my love for man. And when I get that right, then I act like God. That's what God is. And then 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we what? In other words, the love of God is that we act like God. And therefore, the law, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And if God is love, then it follows, then his law is love. And when we love, therefore, we keep the, the commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Can you say amen to that tonight? Love for God is the only motivation for serving God. My choice Because I love Jesus, I want by the grace of God to keep his commandments and do his will. How many here want to make that decision tonight? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've had to hear your word. And Lord, we need your spirit. We need more of Jesus. We need more of God. We need more of you and less of self. Father, send us your spirit to recreate our hearts so that we can actually keep God's laws, not because we're trying, but because the spirit is in our hearts and it becomes natural. Lord, we're not inclined to pray, but we need you to help us to make it natural as it was for Jesus. Father, send us your spirit, because without him, we are left to our own hearts and we know where that goes. So send us your spirit tonight. This we pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right, we look forward to tomorrow at 6 p.m., not 7, 6 p.m. We're going to talk about the cure to low self-esteem, and then at 7 o'clock, we're going to talk about history's greatest hoax. Good night.